So what other instruments have you been using? Okay, with... let me show you. Let's go, let's go. Yeah. Okay, so um, I used that one. It's a oh, twin boy. string. What? what model is that? It's an Ibanez, actually. Oh, sweet. And it's a funny story behind it because um, my dad got that like in the eighties, and he got that from a from a radio like ad, like you know um, we didn't have internet back then, so <laughs> it was like uh, a woman just had to, to sell this guitar because she wanted to learn guitar, and the guy at the shop sold her this. I mean, it's not a good idea to start learning guitar on a 12 string. <laughs> no, I agree with that. It, it just, it's so hard to, you know, you need a lot of uh, muscles to, to be able to play it. Yeah. And, and it's a pain to, to tune, of course, but the sound is amazing. So uh, I have used that on, on a couple of recordings. And uh, I think most prominently on uh, the fourth uh, Schnee track. The split with Trutk. Yeah, the like the beginning and also the like intro and outro of the song are recorded with this one. And my dad paid only like 80 bucks for it, so it's was a steal. <laughs> it's yeah. a really nice guitar. Yeah, because I've I don't think I've ever seen a 12 string going for that cheap, and especially like no. an 80s Ibanez as well. And it's interesting because the Ibanez acoustics I've played, I think I've preferred the neck feel compared to like the Ibanez RGs, especially. Okay. And even even the Ibanez basses as well, I find them more comfortable than like regular Ibanez. Okay. I also use this one, a lute. Oh, epic. But it's tuned like a guitar. So you can play it like a normal guitar. So it's, it's not like a, a real medieval lute, you know, it's kind of like more modern version of it. But uh, I got that for free. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure, <laughs> I take it. And uh, I've also used that on uh, several albums. It has a uh, very warm tone to it. So it's different than a guitar from just from the tone. And um, I used that on the same title, Besage Dibe. So... I've used that one. It has like in the first song, it has like this interlude with uh, acoustic guitar. It's basically recorded with the lute. It's not a guitar, the lute. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Little detail. <laughs> uh, what are, I don't even know what lutes are normally tuned to. Um, well, they have more strings and I have no idea how they're tuned, actually. No, me neither. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I know I'm... a guy who plays like real medieval lutes, so uh, I should ask him once. Yeah. Um, and is that tuned? Is that tuned to C sharp as well? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then of course I also have a bass. So this is like uh, self-designed. Yeah. That was my first inst electric instrument I bought. Um, it used to be a, or well still is a whole nut bass. And it was like, it had this like huge body, you know, and it was a uh, ugly, like hell. Right. And so I decided, well, why not? I mean, it's big, quite big, so I have quite a lot of space to actually form something different. And so I did my own design to it. <laughs> and oh, really? I um, put in EMGs. And so, as you can see, I still don't have like uh, uh, any space for the battery. <laughs> I still have to make something. But yeah, I use that one on all recordings. And it's actually sounds quite fine now with the uh, EMGs. So when did you change the body shape and how did you do it? Did you like borrow, do you have your own, like your saw and just like hacked it yourself or did you use someone's machine? Like, how, um, how did you it? No, I did it at school because we had quite uh, a lot of woodwork machinery there. So I was able to just, uh, you know, it's like a, a saw. It's like a band saw, you know, yeah. it's like a band on two wheels. And so it's, it was quite simple to, to, uh, make the form the basic form and then it's just a lot of handwork yeah with uh, sanding and stuff make it smooth that's awesome and how long did it take you to do it oh actually that one uh maybe two weeks i mean not every day work you know but it's, uh, it went pretty quick actually i mean uh, i also made a, a whole base by myself back then this one. Oh, that looks cool 
And this is actually, uh, the design is a copy. This this uh, base exists. I don't even remember uh, what brand it was, honestly. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's actually a funny story because I've never ever seen anyone playing this bass. And, uh, you know, we played in Oslo last weekend and Toulouse was playing before us. The bassist has exactly the, the, the original bass I took the design from. I was just really <laughs> funny to see, like, oh, I know that bass. Uh, but it, it's, it's really cool and everything, but um, I made the neck a bit too thin and it can't withhold the, you know, the, the pull from the strings. So it always bends. So I have to see if I can have it re reinforced in, in, in the neck or something. Because yeah, I I made that like twenty years ago and was never really able to to use it because of that, oh, and wow. that was a bit frustrating. Uh, because yeah, you know, otherwise it's all perfect, but just because of that, I can't use it. So yeah. Oh, and that's um, even with trying very thin bass strings, right? Yeah. Well. Mm didn't help that much oh, that's such a, <laughs> a shame. little bit sure but it's it's just i mean it now it's just uh tuned really low then it's it's okay as you you can play it but if you like tune it on yeah c flat it's yeah. just too much of force i see and it just bends through and then you have like the strings the gap is so big you know you can't really Played. And another instrument I used was this one. A oh, flute. oh, yeah. I used that on uh, one song on uh, Winterkälte. It's my sister's. And uh, that's the instrument she learned when she was a kid. And at some point, uh, she was like, I don't play it anymore. Do you want to have it? I was like, sure. <laughs> uh, but I can't really play it, you know. It's just um, just for that one song, uh, I just figured out the melody and then uh, recorded it. That's amazing. So let's let's get the right. So you, you do vocals, you do guitar, you do bass, you do violin, you do recorder. Are there any other instruments <laughs> that you that you've done and played and recorded? Uh, well, drums, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keyboards. I mean, I don't really play piano, but I mean, just like the basics, I, I do know. Um, I still have... Uh, also, you know, these instruments just like come to me. I don't know. I don't buy them. They just want to be at my place or want to be played by me or something. I don't know. <laughs> and I also have a... Uh, let me show you. But I haven't played it yet. So uh, I still have to figure out the basics at least. You know what that is? That, oh, I know the, I know of it, but I've forgotten its name. That must be a type of harp. It is? <laughs> All right, that's cool. Because I was thinking it was um, similar to like a uh, like the guzeng or a koto. Well, every all the Finnish people, uh, of course, will know what that is. This instrument, because it's the national, well, yeah, national instrument of Finland, and it's called the uh, kantele. I don't think I'll be able to pronounce that. <laughs> no, it's really simple, kantele. Cantele. There we go. Yeah. There you okay, go. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Cantele. No, that's really that's really neat. I've always wanted to um I've always wanted to play one of those big, big yeah because it just um it was I think it must have been because of like Tom and Jerry or something when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. You know, I I can't remember what it was, but it's just like they were like playing the harp or something or like Looney Tunes. It was a cartoon yeah. from, from um my childhood. I've just always wanted to like play harps and Stuff like that. So the um the cantele mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is that going to be featured on any future Paysage de Vey? It's planned to, yeah. But yeah. I have to see if I find the time and and 
actually can figure out how to play something nice with it. <laughs> and so because this is totally, you know, uh, new to me, I have never played something like that before. Another thing that's popped up since our last call is um, the announcement of Dark Space Minus Two. Yes. Yes, and um, I have pre-ordered it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I have pre-ordered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the um, the general writing and creative process when it came to um, Minus Two, because how many tracks are going to be on there? One. Just one? It's just one track, yeah. Oh, epic. And is it that 47 minute one? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> All right, sweet. And then Dark Space 5. So since our last call, how much development is there on Dark Space 5? Oh, since then, uh, none so far or not that much, no. Because, yeah, we just played in Oslo. So before that, we weren't able to do anything for the album. And how was the show in Oslo? Oh, a bit chaotic, I would say. Yeah, was not the easiest circumstances. Also, uh, you know, flying the equipment is always, uh, yeah, a hassle, I would say. Because, uh, you know, there are always some screws uh, loosened. And this time, like one of our cases was open. It opened up. So uh, the hard disk, the hard drive was missing for our, uh, you know, drums and stuff. Luckily, we had the second one with us, backup. And um, also the antenna for the in-ear metronome was missing. So uh, on stage, uh, I'm the furthest away from, from this unit. So um, I always had like these gaps, you know, uh, in the metronome. And we also use gaps as like a marker, so we know when to change riffs and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, that was a bit confusing <laughs> uh, to be very concentrated on stage to be able to follow the song. That's and we were only able to play Dark Space Minus 2. We would have loved to play like the long set with uh, Dark 16 and Dark 10 as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is as it is. And um yeah, no, I think we made the best out of it and uh, be quite happy with the result. No, that's great. And because um, that would just sound like to me, like one of my worst nightmares of like everything, just little things just going wrong and not not, not knowing what's going to happen on stage. There was a video on YouTube from the show and I watched it and it was just like, yes, it did work out. I think so, out. yeah. And how long did it take to write Minus Two? Um. You know, it started out with um, with um, just this ambient ambient track with um, uh, yeah this techno kick and distorted snare. I did, which was actually uh, more like well, not background music, but the music was added to to like a speech, uh, also female speech. It was a different speech we were using now um, on the album. But that's basically how it started, and it was just a playing around because I was just wondering if I could do like a soundtrack to this to this speech, you know. And it was lying around I, because I couldn't really, I didn't really have any use for it. So um, when it uh, when we were about to write new material, I was uh, listen, guys, I have this old material, uh, ambient stuff, electronic stuff, uh, which I would love to try out with guitars if it would work, actually. And so that's how it started, yeah. And then I just tried out guitar stuff and uh, showed it to the other guys, and they were like, hell yeah, it works, and it's super cool, let's do it. So it went pretty quick, actually, from, from you know, when we started to uh, record guitars, or, or I tried started to try out how it sounds with guitars, it was pretty quick. The recording process was uh, longer than the writing process. <laughs> see, I see. And why is it that some Dark Space albums are minus albums? Minus one was basically our demo. Yeah, and um, we we never really released it. So uh, uh, we recorded Dark Space One, and I think it was even 
maybe after Dark Space 2, I don't remember correctly. We were like, yeah, what do we do with this minus or with this demo recordings with these two songs? Because it's a pity just to just not have them released, but it's not really a proper album. So what do we do with it? And so we decided to do this like minus one because it's not really a proper album. And now, um, with the changes within the band, uh, we felt that it is like a, a new beginning for the band. And uh, so we came up with the idea of this minus two. So it's like a follow up to minus one, basically. Cool. Sounds good. And when it came to finding East, the new member, what mm -hmm. was the process? <laughs> good question. Um, we saw pretty quickly that it was very difficult to find a bassist. It's just not um, the most played instrument in the metal scene, I would say. <laughs> so um, I don't know. We just had um, gave word around. We didn't. Well, we we did try an ad, but not like as dark space, more like anonymously. Just like metal band seeks for bassists something like that but no it just like with with our contacts um just friends and stuff we we said we were looking for a bassist and um yeah we had like three three guys and um tried them out and with ease it just yeah it, i mean the, the the chemistry was already there before he even played the instrument i was like yeah that's that's the guy you know and the funny thing is that um, his parents are actually neighbors to Sadal. <laughs> so they <laughs> almost like grew up as neighbors and never met before. You know, it's just like a small world. Funny story. But uh, yeah, he's um, he's great. I mean, he's actually a guitarist. So it's, it's not, bass is not his main instrument, but... Uh, He's he's professional musician, so uh, he knows how to play. For sure, yeah, yeah. Like the guy, I can just tell. Like when as soon as I saw him play, it's like, yeah, this guy knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's perfect. Yeah, because um, sometimes for most bands, when they try to find a bass player, it's really just like a guitarist being like, all right, I'll play bass. Yeah, it's often the the case. Yeah. Yeah, and that was going to be like my next question, but it's already been answered. It was going to be, you know for for dark space what's the idea to find a purpose a purpose built bass player like a practiced and seasoned specifically bass player but it seems like east can do guitar and bass and um a lot more um in terms of sound like what you were saying before in the first yeah. call how we just able to create like all these soundscapes and stuff and i'm just so looking forward to hearing dark space five <laughs> yeah it might take a while yeah and but that's okay because i think it's it's good when musicians and bands take their time especially with the music because then because like if we think about it um so say for example band a releases a an album in 2023 and one in 2024 yeah there's not going to be that much time or development to really hone every single song um maybe it might but in most situations if like a band is releasing an album very very quickly then it's each album becomes less kind of important in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, maybe. Yes. It's not necessarily, but I know, um, I get what you're saying. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess important is the wrong word. It's like, um, it's, it's, it, there are quite some bands that, that in my opinion, um, really have releases too, too close to each other. Hmm. And, uh, because of that, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm still like discovering the older album and then they already come with a new album. So it's, for me, it's too quick to even be able to get into the new one. And uh, often it is like, it lacks a bit of like, yeah, just development time, you know, to ripe. <laughs> but yeah. like with Besar Stieve, the first couple of recordings I did like in, in, well, sometimes I even made two albums in one year or demos or whatever you want to call it. But back then I really, I didn't do anything else. 
besides of that, I mean, yeah, I had to work and stuff, but other than that, I was just always uh, just, you know, recording and I was trying out quite different stuff. So uh, they really differ from each other. It's not the same thing at all. It worked there, but it's it's a pace I couldn't uphold. You know, it's just not possible to do that forever. You know, that's mm. so. It, I think it it can work if you if you just stay in in your typical kind of scheme. Then I think it's difficult to to do something substantially good with the short time period. But uh, if you like do something more experimental on one album, for instance, I think it it can work. I think so as well. And that's a really, really interesting point that you raised up. Even when, when writing sometimes, I don't know, that there, there, there are there are creative bursts when you mm -hmm. just have a guitar in your hand and for some reason the riffs and the songs just fly out and you've got like a few songs in a very, very short period of time. But it's these days it's not very rare. I mean, it, it depends, like I don't know, for me, it's like I don't wanna I don't wanna rush things especially when it comes to like yeah. music and, and mm. making songs because i don't think it's i don't think it suits the song and i don't think it suits the final end result if things are rushed mm. yeah i mean sometimes it happens that it, things just flow so well it's like bang and you have a song it was like how did that happen you know but sometimes it just takes a long time and there are songs that they just take forever they just don't want to to be finished somehow I had one of these songs on uh, Involved. That was like an old recording from like maybe 2001. And it just never got finished. And at some point I just took it and I was like, what? I should finish that song at some point. And uh, on Involved, it was it just fitted perfectly. It just really waited that long for being on that album. I almost changed nothing. I added uh, like an acoustic guitar, I think, or maybe a, uh, like a melody. And that was uh, basically it, you know, even the recording itself was from back in the time. So um didn't really have to change much. Add vocals. It didn't have any vocals yet. Um, drums were uh, reprogrammed and that was it, basically. So, yeah, it's just you can never tell. You know, mm -hmm. I think most important is that you just, you play. And before I even made the first uh, album, um, I had like at least three 90 minutes tapes full of riffs that I recorded just I, as an idea, as a like library of ideas. And um, I still use uh, riffs from there at times. I just listen to it and just play press play and the first couple of of tones inspire me for a riff or something like that so it's 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 a real treasure trove i can very much recommend to do that just record your stuff even if it's just one riff doesn't matter you you never know when you can use it awesome because that was was you were talking i was just going to ask the question do you record your riffs and then come back to them later? But of course you do. And yes, um, I think that's even now, I think that's a really, really good idea um, because sometimes because I well, I it's two ways of thinking because my personal way of thinking is if I forget a riff, then it's not good enough. But at the same time, if I listen back to a riff and it just works, mm -hmm. then I shouldn't have forgot it. And then it was my mistake. Yeah, and sometimes it's like not too interesting riffs are perfect somewhere in a song hmm. you know just like as in the composition it makes sense to be there so um you never know and also sometimes i'm like oh yeah this is cool i have to record it and uh, oh this is quite okay too uh, just record it and like a couple of days later i'm like oh actually the riff I thought was the cooler one is actually not that good, but the other one is really interesting. So it's also it, my perception shifts at times. Hmm. So it's always good to record. Yeah, for sure. And it's sometimes it's like there's never a bad riff. It's just a case of it entirely depends on the context and the purpose. Yes. And also it also depends on the um, overall arrangement as well, because... Hmm. If you've got like a super, super technical riff, 
say something like then a riff like that is sometimes it works for vocals and like the more kind of tech death stuff and then but then at the same time if it's one of those things that you're trying to play and can't sing along then it becomes a bit messy and then sometimes it's better if you just have a bit more of a boring riff yeah the vocals yeah exactly and um not not even just i was i say boring but like a simplified riff just so something that just works yeah. gives the vocals a bit more space yeah because well. it's all about it's an interesting thing when it comes to songwriting and composition because it's a kind of push pull mm. of everything it's like sometimes an overcomplicated bass part can work really well over a very very simple guitar part exactly mm. and a very very complicated um drum part can work over simply sim simple guitar parts as well but then even something like on a guitar part if you've got like um like a crazy riff but you've got like some kind of stabs going on that's that's quite like a death metal writing technique so like mm. a... yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then work it like that and i think that's um I think that's something that people can really, really think about with when it comes to their songwriting, because mm. more is more sometimes, but less of one thing is more of the other, which then somehow gives more of the overall kind of impact. Definitely, yeah. yeah. yeah especially with uh, Beza Stieve, um it's, it's, well, I don't want to overdo it, but um, it's definitely about simplicity. You know, just keep it as simple as possible. Just like really, really reduced, reduced to the max. That's like kind of the one of the goals I have with it. It's not about um, technicality or anything. You know, it's it's just really about atmosphere and and emotions basically. And so, um, yeah, that's that's something that just totally fascinates me. You know, if you just have like this magic melody that you could just play forever and totally drift with it you know that's that's what i like dark space is a bit different but um still of course it has the uh, psychedelic element to it which oh. is repetition definitely is a part of uh, being psychedelic in music in my opinion you know? Mm. Repetitiveness. yeah it kind of um yeah it's like how we um how we're talking before like the hypnotism yes writing and just going mm. on and on because on, i was listening to um the most recent paysage uh, divay album on the drive home today and it was this one song i think it was alt where there was just this one riff that just kept on repeating but all of the notes kind of just hit it was um that's actually the song I was talking about. Oh, the t the one from 2001? Yeah, this old one. That's why it's called Alt, because Alt means old in German. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's the perfect title for this song, right? And it's just it's just really, really cool. It's just I was listening to it and I'm just like, damn, it's just Yeah. It just it something about something about the way you write just makes me very happy <laughs> <laughs> something about the way um you create music just makes me very very happy because it's just mm -hmm. it's just so easy to relax into it it's just like you're mm -hmm. taking somewhere and it's just exactly like how how you want the music to go and how it's pictured and i think it's just i think it's great you know good for driving as well like mm -hmm. even even like driving late at night just listening to dark space especially if you're on just the motorway and you're just driving and driving long, long journeys. You just kind of like, it's like your car becomes the spaceship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, no, it's great. And that was going to be um, another question that I wanted to ask you. Where do you listen to music most? And is it through like car speakers? Is it vinyl, CDs, uh, MP3, phone? What it, What is it nowadays? Um, Mostly in the living room. Because that's uh, where I have the vinyl player and uh, the nice speakers and um, and yeah, mostly vinyl I would say. But that has always been like that. That's not not nothing new to me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I still have some CDs, but I I like never buy CDs nowadays. If I buy something, I'll get it on vinyl if possible. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I think the last CD I bought was like 
maybe 10 or 15 years ago or something. Other, other than that, always vinyl. Most of the stuff is available on vinyl, so uh, it's fine. So I listen to MP3s, but not, not that much. I see. Um, do you remember what the CD you got was? Yes, it was uh, Apoptose, German am ambient Apoptose. Okay. A couple of CDs and yeah, it's um, it's really nice. You should listen to it. When something is organic, mm -hmm. people can appreciate um, that kind of writing and that kind of style a lot more because in some ways it's more familiar to mm. listen to that kind of stuff um because for example like let, let's take let's take this example okay so i absolutely love the guitar sounds on um, a software i'm using so i'm currently using um neural dsp's kajira plugin on my mm -hmm. laptop okay i use that for most of my short videos for like um you know when i'm filming for like tiktoks and short videos on youtube but for most of the time i like listening to the sound of the actual amps because mm. it's, the sound from gojira is like way too perfect it's like they've got like the right mic it's like they've had many many hundreds of pounds or maybe thousands of pounds worth of equipment to make something sound as good as possible mm. i think it's great but at the same and you know i guess it's really really good for home recordings and the way the modern guitarist is writing now but I think people are becoming slightly more disappointed by the sound of a real um, of real amps and real equipment because it's kind of like people are getting too used to synthetic sounds. The, the synthetic sounds are good. There's nothing wrong with them. It's no. I think in some ways, it's kind. I don't want to say it's jading the ears of the listener, but at, but there's something that there's a different kind of sound that you get from digital equipment versus anything that's truly analog um, mm. and i and i think vinyl versus cd is a very very good example of this as well because i don't know i don't know what how or why but i i first of all i hardly ever listen to vinyls but i was at a friend house friend's house the other day and we were listening to a rebel extravaganza by mm -hmm. Terracon. great album and you know every time i'm listening to it off spotify or in the car or on youtube or whatever like it's fine but then when you listen to rebel extravaganza on vinyl it's like you get a whole nother layer of sound but i can't put my finger on what that sound is except the vinyl sound yeah. this there's a richness to it and i think that's what a lot of things in modern production and sound these days is like this kind of rich organic almost natural sort of sound yeah after speaking to nocturnal culto watching like interviews from fenris as well he was saying like you know fenris was saying you know the best drum sounds come from like the 70s because that's what a drum that's what the drums actually sound like and that's why in their albums and everything they shift completely away from all the kind of modern sounds as well yeah and i think we need a bit more of that now i think everyone's trying to make things kind of too perfect mm. and i think it's good to have like this level of a more human quality to music now especially yes. um, because it's there in writing but i think it's being lost more and more in production because it's kind of like i think people are overthinking things sometimes i don't i don't know what it is what do you what do you think it could be i don't know what's your thoughts on all this well i mean you have much much better possibilities you know for for much less money with all the digital um but that that's that's one part it's it gotten so much easier than like with in analog times you know and thus a lot cheaper I mean, we we always recorded our stuff by by ourselves. We never have been to a studio, except for the re-recording of uh, Dark Space Minus One. But we were in the studio only for mixing for the mixing process, which was uh, a totally good decision in my opinion. So so we're happy about these possibilities, you know. But uh, the reason why we did this was also uh, because we wanted to take our time. And don't have to rush things in a studio and uh we wanted to have a distinctive sound 
and not just the sound like other bands have or any other band has. So um, I don't know. It's it's also got a lot to do with knowledge we have nowadays. You know, it's it's known where in what frequencies uh, uh, whatever a snare sound has to be or should be. You know where it sounds best. It. Same thing goes with guitars, with, with amps, with everything, you know. So um, I think it's it's a mix of these two things. The possibilities that came through uh, the digitalization of recording and also uh, the knowledge, you know. But in the end, you know, you it's, it's also a matter of uh, what you choose. I mean, okay, you, you can have it... Uh, like in like perfect you know in, in production and everything or you can have it your own way with like a little imperfection that makes it individual i think for for a really distinctive sound it has to have a little bit of imperfection at least a little bit of imperfection to it to to be in, individual i think that's if you have like this perfect mix, for example, and if you just move a little bit like over there or a little bit over there or make it like peak out here, uh, yeah, that's my sound. I think um, that helps. Hmm. And also experimentation. I mean, you can also experiment a lot with effects, you know, with pedal boards or, or stuff like that, and to to do something different. Yeah. I think it's it's also a matter of um, imagination, I guess, you know, of being creative. So instead of trying to find the perfect sound, um, I was about trying to to find your personal unique sound. Yeah, I think that's really, really important as well. Here's a prime example, okay? I'm going to use myself as an example, okay? So one of my favorite guitar tones ever is 1349's Revelation of the Black Flame, a guitar mm -hmm. tone. Um, just the way that the way that amp sounds, I think it was like a modded JCM 800, and it's just huge. Like the guitar mm -hmm. sound is huge, and I've always kind of wanted it. And I spent a long time trying to get close, but then I realized, is this really me? Yeah. Really what I want. And then that's the, um, and that's kind of like the, I guess the philosophical part of, of creativity where it's like, is this really me? Is this what I want to create? Or am I just trying to be, you know, <laughs> a pastiche or a, just an imita imitation of, uh, of what 1349 is? That case of exactly what you're saying is like trying to be more your unique and um, more yourself. And going to what you were saying about dark uh, recording dark space as well so what was the recording process for minus two was it recorded in the band room um on yes. okay okay so it was literally just like okay bring a laptop in set the interface up you know mic the cabs in a certain way and just just track everything like that well it's it's not a laptop it's uh -huh. like a big tower computer oh, and um we have a uh, 24 channel mixing console hooked up to it through firewire and uh yeah with that we basically recorded all the stuff um so yeah from from me my guitars i always use two tracks um directly from from my uh, preamp the effects unit i've shown you and mm -hmm. then uh also mic'd um channels um yeah i have like oh i it's already a while ago we recorded that thing so um i think it's six tracks just my guitars so uh yeah it's always always so it's basically like three tracks but it's always two two tracks as to have like a stereo effect and um with uh, Sodal, I think it's about the same. Yeah. And two bass tracks. So it it uh, it adds up quite a bit with all the uh, 
ambient and uh, synthesizer tracks and um samples and stuff it's almost added to uh, 100 tracks in the end wow okay that's a lot <laughs> quite a lot to handle but you know you have tracks where you just have like one sound on it you know but i mean if you're not limited in in tracks then just keep it on one track you know if, even if it's just one small sound yeah we also had a recording session uh for for the overheads with a real drum and that was well worth it we have uh, really nice uh overhead samples now and we have also used uh, these on the dark space minus two so that's that was a lot of work but it paid off definitely and uh, yeah what else can i say i mean it's um it's always um experimenting with with different amps with different caps with different um microphones with different microphone combinations with different microphone uh positionings you know so it's it's endless um yeah but i, I think we did uh, very well also thanks to to ease and his knowledge he, he brought in some new ideas that we uh used and uh that was very helpful helped us a lot with, especially with uh the um elite guitars that was really cool yeah um yeah that's that's about it <laughs> so you use your preamp system and mm -hmm. um, was that plugged straight into the uh, mixing board or did that go through your mesa boogie which was then mic'd up via cabs or uh both so uh first tracks i uh, record are always directly from from uh, the zoom and but not like you know you, you can also um set it to stereo which i use for live but for recording i always uh record two tracks mono after the other and make that as like the stereo track sounds best in my opinion um but yeah if you know that's my way of doing it <laughs> oh, sure. uh, there's oh, sure. are different possibilities of course and um then i have the same thing uh mic'd with the mesabuki and um i have also two tracks um through the jcm with like uh uh one one single like a single 12 inch marshall cap and this um you can't really hear it what it does it gives like more depth to the sound it is like it has a bit more room space which is of course a great thing for a dark space that's why i used them <laughs> and i guess that's why the dark space live tone is so heavy is because you've got this zoom um preamp set to stereo so yeah. how, how does it so with this with the sound engineers how much time do you guys need to sound check because it seems like most of your stuff is pretty much plug and play but it's a case of how do you um like what do you have to communicate to the sound guy to get this kind of like huge sound um well we have our own uh, um sound guy mm -hmm. so that helps a lot he, he knows our music he knows uh the instruments and and everything so that helps a lot for sure but well it, it really depends i mean if if the um venues the, the people there if they read our tech rider correctly and uh prepared well we are actually pretty quick with setting everything up and uh we we don't always have a time for um you know like a real mix so uh sometimes we just have to plug in and, and play so it was also like that in oslo we didn't really have time for a sound check uh, because we also flew in in on Friday, had to play on Friday, so there was no time for a sound check, and that's always a bit difficult, of course. So it's uh, we still have like a line check song um, on our hard disk, so uh, we definitely need to do that just in order to be sure everything works, you know. Um, so. Yeah, the, the the toughest was probably on on Hellfest. We had like only fifteen to twenty minutes change over time, so that was that was pretty tough. But it worked, and yeah, we have pretty much everything set up already 
so it should be simple enough to yeah we just try to keep it as simple as possible with all all our gear you know it's not the usual stuff because we don't have drum and stuff and and uh my my guitar life is is also directly out through a di no no uh microphones or anything so uh it's, it's all a bit different but mm. it works usually yeah cuz i i cuz i was in the audience and i was thinking like God, I, I can't remember what amp it was behind you. But I think it might have been a Mesa Boogie dual rectifier behind you at, at Cosmic Void. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought you were I've... running through that and you just had like this crazy pedal set up and you just made managed to make this sound like a fucking chaos storm, <laughs> demonic, chunky demon. Thing. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. I thought you were using that, but I didn't realize you were going like straight line in. Like, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's that, always, that. Um, you know, when, when we fly, I can't take my, my uh, amp with me. So uh, I only have the uh, preamp and I go directly uh, to the return. I see. So and... I don't use the preamp from the amp. I only use like, you know, the amp. In your perspective, what is the perfect dark space show like what would be the location um, oh. what 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 where would it be around the world and um and what 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 kind of audience what kind of stage what kind of location just what would be like your most perfect show like proper um, bucket list oh difficult question i don't know <laughs> i would have to talk about it with the uh, with the other guys Nothing I can really answer right now, I'm afraid. Hmm. Um, well, you know, we, we definitely would like to play places we haven't played before. You know, that's definitely one thing. So, I mean, we have played uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, quite often. Just happened that way, you know, it wasn't planned that way. And so we are like, yeah, okay, uh, maybe um, it's it's good uh, enough for a while. Just you know, we have never played in Spain or Portugal, for instance, you know, or or Greece. Um, countries like that would be interesting, definitely. Um, but like from from the venue, um. You know, it's it's we don't have like a specific. Um, okay, this is like the best venue ever. We, we like small concerts. We we like large halls. Uh, can work at both. Um, yeah, you have both pros and cons. Um, I can't really tell you honestly. When it comes to your shows, are there any bands that you would really like to gig with? <laughs> like just in just in general, just like as a general thing, like um, what what bands would you like to play with? Well, I think what would go well together is uh, Dark Space and Mysticum, for for instance. But uh, we definitely also like to have like you know um, different genres mixed together, so not just like ten black metal bands at one evening, but you have like whatever. It can't be metal all or so, but just like different styles, different bands, more uniqueness to it. Instead of 10 bands playing the same thing, you know, it just gets boring. So, um, yeah, we really like that kind of stuff. And maybe also uh, more like open towards, you know, all of, of the artistic world, you know, to combine different arts, different different kind of music or, or oral arts you know things like that you know we played uh, a show in Innsbruck in Austria and uh, it was pretty small club nothing big but uh, very intimate uh, from from that side it was uh, really nice and they combined it with um, uh, watching Alien the first Alien movie in the cinema first and then a uh, dark space concert so the that was very appealing to us, for instance. <laughs> Things like that, you know. Or, um, yeah, the others. Um, uh, it was more like the combination of bands, you know. Um, also bands like we, we like ourselves. and 
things like that. It's difficult to say, you know, it's, um, how dedicated people are. <laughs> That's definitely one of the reasons, yeah, too. Hmm. Sure, yeah, that's um, that's awesome. When I first got into dark space, it was around twenty thirteen, and then there was like, there was there wasn't any dark space shows for a while, or nothing that I saw that was on my radar until like, well, I think it was twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, something like that. And then dark space started popping up more uh, regularly on festivals around the world. So, is it is it more now that you guys have decided, okay, let's try and show dark space in the live show or is it just the kind of thing where you didn't want to gig before um or am i just being completely dumb and not paying attention to dark space shows <laughs> oh, no we, we it's um we haven't played that many shows in our career um that's for sure but it's mostly because it's just difficult to find time for it you know there's no no like reason to to make uh dark space rare on stage or something like that you know it's um if we record uh, or if we write and record an album we don't really have time or, or the resources to play live so we just concentrate on that and um then we can play a couple of shows but then we also would like to continue you know writing music i mean for me personally, at least, this is still uh, like the most important part. Um, I don't know. It's um, I I don't really know if it really got more or stayed the same over the years. I have the feeling it stayed the same, but I might be wrong. Maybe maybe we played more uh, recently than we used to. I'm not sure. I remember like I was trying to find dark space live videos and for ages there was only the one that you guys did at Hellfest. Yeah. Well, and there are others from like um CD release concert in Bern for Dark Space 2, no, 3. I think yeah, Dark Space 3. That's pretty old actually. Okay, I so, might um... I might have come across with that. Um, it's been a long time, but I definitely remember there were more dark space videos on YouTube popping up during and around the release time of Dark Space Four. Yes, maybe it's also because um, more people had you know mobile phones able to actually record that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and th that's another thing that I was thinking about as well, like with the rise of technology and everything. Uh, yes. And um, I well, from a from a fan's perspective, I think it's great because I'm one of those geeks that tries to work out exactly what the bands are playing by watching them live. Okay, mm. I'm one of those guys. And that do you know what? I was actually having a conversation with someone about this. And how would you feel if there was a official Dark Space tab book or a Paysage de Vey tab book? It's fine. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anyone's interested in that. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because um. All right, cool. Because I'm the kind of guy that would be like, I would actually try that. And yeah. and actually, one of my friends like we've we've began to to start tabbing uh, more songs for uh, YouTube, and we do like some covers, and we're planning more and more covers now and stuff. And we just had this idea like, hey, what if there was a X band uh, tab book? So um, no, that's really cool. I'm, I'm really 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 happy actually, because um, I might end up just. I might even just end up doing um, some dark space and paysage divay out um, covers in four on the channel. It's an idea I've been toying okay. with, but sure, also I would like to, and I'd like to, um, I would actually like to try and do a collaborative cover, uh, doing a dark space song, but seeing if there's a, a drummer who would be up for playing dark space songs on a real drums. Okay, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I think that would be really cool, and. Um, yeah, it's just ideas I've been toying with. Maybe that could be something I can start in 2024. This one you were talking about? That is, yes, yes. Okay. That's the one I've actually too. Oh, sweet. So these are all your drawings. So these are photographs. Okay, gotcha. And uh that was taken in uh Norway actually. In I think it was the summer of 
either 1998 or 99. I'm not quite sure. And uh, that was taken in a small town between um, Bergen and Oslo. And it's called Finse. Of course, all Norwegian people know exactly what I'm talking about. And I was just talking uh, to a really nice guy in Oslo about Finns. Eh? And he said they also uh, filmed some of the scenes for uh, Lord of the Rings there. I didn't know about that. And it's a really, it's a, it's a huge glacier nearby. And we were there in summer. It's about a little bit more than, I think it's uh, like 1,100 meters above sea level. So it's not that high, but uh, you, as you can see, it's a snow field and it, it was snowing like that when we were there in summer. <laughs> so it's a, it's quite a rough place. And yeah, that's where these pictures were taken. And it's actually with corpse paint and everything. So uh, quite dedicated. Yeah. Then. And what about Kristall and Isa? That's uh, Swiss Alps. And, yeah. Canton of Graubünden. That was taken there. It's um, uh, a valley that goes up to a um, small village. Which is called Juf, Avers Juf. It's the highest place in whole of Europe that uh, where people live the whole year. You know, we have higher places, but they're abandoned in winter. But people live there throughout the whole year, and it's above the you know tree level, so no trees, quite high up. And it in this picture was taken in that valley. It's quite uh, quite a raw and untouched valley. It's just a road going up. Uh, other than that, you have like, um, uh, yeah, like a river going down, a stream going down, really wild, and uh, mountains and forests. Yeah, sounds epic. And did you hike up there to get the um, <laughs> or was it just actually, your holiday or something? Um, yeah, we were there at, at the cottage, cottage from my family in uh, Andir. And uh, my dad uh, went up there to ski. They have like a small ski lift up there. And I was like, yeah, um, take me with you and just drop me somewhere and I'll walk down. And that's what I did. So I didn't hike up. I hiked down and had a video camera with me and like two photo cameras. And I just took pictures and, and filmed. So for uh, the video I made for uh, Schnee 2, uh, that's also all from, from that session. The, the whole material awesome that's so cool and do you think you'll be doing more um paysage duvet music videos in this kind of fashion in like wintry landscapes and no nah, probably not no i don't think so maybe ne never say never but uh, i just wanted to do that and back in the time i never really found the time and and didn't really have the equipment and uh, at some point i was like okay let's do it and so finally i was able to do it even though it was like 15 or 20 years later <laughs> than anticipated, but who cares? I mean, the, the raw material is all VHS recordings, which is pretty cool. So, raw. Yeah, for sure. And when it comes to, well, if you're going to make a music video for a Dark Space song, how would you want it to be? Um, What would you want in there? Animated, that's for sure. Other than that, it doesn't really make much sense in our opinion. Mm -hmm. We're working on it, so maybe there will be something at some point. We'll see. Okay, cool. I'm not going to, I do you know what? I'm not going to press anymore because I'd rather be surprised with the final result with the, yeah. uh, with the, uh, well, the official Dark Space uh, music video. And um, going over some of the other album ops, like Geister, the one mm -hmm. with the, um, with like the mask, was that mm -hmm. one of your paintings as well? No, that's a photograph. Um, I took that from newspaper actually. So it was like really raw, you know, and uh, just uh, worked on it. 
digitally to have it a bit smoothened out and stuff, but still like have that really raw character because I think it just fits perfectly to to these masks. Yeah. Sure. And do you know what the um the mask is of or who that figure is? Well, it's it's a mask cult in, in one valley in the Swiss Alps in Canton uh, Valleys. It's called uh, Lötchental. And there uh, you have this uh, mask cult. They have uh, similar mask cults also in uh, Norway and uh, Austria. And uh, seems to be um, Germanic specific because it's a valley that was like really remote and, and uh, you were almost not able to get there before you had like, you know, cars and roads. So it, it like really pre preserved that uh, old um, mask cult. That's fascinating. I had no idea. It that is. <laughs> I had no Dark idea stuff. that these mask cult exist. So these are so these are people. Is it like day to day they live their lives with masks on? Or... No, it's just one time in in the year. So... Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so for for festivals and or or whatever celebratory. Well, they have uh, one part for the tourists and the other part really they still keep for themselves. No tourists allowed, which is pretty cool. So they really try to, um, uh, well, they at one hand have to open up because, you know, there's interest from outside. So you have this touristic part of it, but they still really try to preserve the, the essence of it, which is uh, pretty cool, I think. And yeah. do you know what... Um what occasion it is that they wear the masks as like what does it symbolize and any story behind it um well that's hmm. for me it's it's uh, i combine that with what what uh we know about the norwegian oskorean i don't know if you have heard about that mask cult um mm -hmm. just really interesting because it has a lot of similarities with with black metal you know you have like they, they were always making a lot of noise and it's the same thing with these uh, Reich Jacketta in uh, in Lötchental here in Switzerland. They also make a, a lot of noise with, you know, cowbells and, and stuff. And um, uh, it's really raw. They were actually, uh, you know, um, having um, like swine blood with them. They would throw at people or like ash uh stuff like that so it was quite nasty too and wild so it's, it's it has to do something with the wild hunt pretty sure so it's it's all all teeth and stuff basically it's not much of that preserved here in switzerland but you can compare it to these other mass cults that are around uh, where it is a bit more um preserved like the knowledge what, what it's really about so it's it's a bit like yeah, I'm sure it's it's like some heathen stuff, but maybe other people in Switzerland would, would disagree. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, I've never heard about this before. It's like when it comes to like um extreme historical groups, the only one that I've kind of known about are the Aghoris in India. And these mm -hmm. are the people who um, you know, they cover themselves in ash and they think like everything is part of God and they um that it makes no difference to them if they eat i don't know a, a, a you know a real chicken as opposed to like a skull for example like there's actually yeah. like, like a few videos on on youtube of some people actually taking human skulls and actually biting them and eating like the teeth okay like, teeth and, and eating them and and all this kind of stuff and they eat like rotting flesh and stuff like that it's a very very extreme extreme part of um of Hinduism that I'm yeah. honestly not too, too familiar with myself, but it's it's the kind of like everything is part of God, so everything is holy, so even the dead stuff is like holy. I think that's part yeah. of the philosophy behind mm -hmm. it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's brutal. It's really, really brutal. Like they, uh, there's like um, I remember watching this one video of a a journalist who actually goes to see some Aghori priests and stuff, and there was um. He gave him there was a skull the priest was holding the skull and inside was like a pit like a it looked like a bit of like brain juice or something like the part of the brain that <laughs> takes out the skull and eats it it's like yeah this is good for you this has got like healing powers and stuff 
wild. See, this is getting on a bit of a tangent talking about like mythology and stuff now, because when it comes to like Hindu mythology, I only really know like most of like the religious stuff, because that's kind of what I grew up with in my family. Because when it comes to like the dark side of Hinduism, of course, there's like these evil characters in the stories and stuff, but I knew nothing about like the Aghori sadhus and things like that. And then there must be like some kind of um, dark cult that worships Kali at some point, you know, the more kind of like evil and more, let's say, black metal side of Hinduism as well. Um, I remember seeing Attila, so he made an Instagram post, and he was in India for a little while, and he was saying that there was this um, special Kali temple, and I did some research on it, and it's apparently there, like, they do certain rituals on people that cure them of, like, mental illnesses, like, suicidal people go there to, like, be healed and stuff, and he said, like going there, seeing some of the rituals has been like the, some of the most black metal stuff he's seen. And, you know, no one's yeah. really allowed in there. You know, you have to make like certain bookings and stuff. Like there's an actual website where it says like, okay, yeah, this is a booking. You have to like actually book yourself in to be like cleansed and stuff. And yeah. I'm, I'm just there thinking like, damn, what actually goes in there? Like, what is yeah. this? What is this extreme dark side of Hinduism that I, that I don't even know about or even know what's going on? And I just think it's, it's in, in some ways, it's like a, a, a odd, morbid curiosity. It's like I kind of want to find out, but it's like, what's going to be, what's going to be the consequence if I see it, if I'm not supposed to, kind of thing. And um, Hindu mythology has got its own kind of crazy, crazy creatures and stories, and yeah, lots of weird stuff around. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah definitely very interesting. Yeah. So here's another question as well. So. So a lot of religions around the world and a lot of people theorize that an extraterrestrial life force came to Earth and like changed people, creating like chimeras and and uh, hybrid humans. Like, do you do you believe in that? Do you believe in aliens? And uh, and do you think there's uh, an extraterrestrial life out there or is there some kind of life out there? What, what do you think? Well, I mean, it's um, if you look at the infiniteness of space, uh, I would find it quite odd if we would be the only ones, for sure. But uh, I don't know if it's really that important. I don't know. Of course, it's definitely fascinating. Um, if the uh, if we already had contact, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, there are definitely uh, very interesting artifacts around, like the plains of Nazca, and stuff like that. You know, so or like old depictions of. Uh, what you would call like uh, astronauts <laughs> and stuff like that, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally into like these mystical things, you know, stuff you can't really explain. And, um, how did that happen? Where does it come from? etc. I think it's very fascinating, you know, um, it doesn't mean that I have to go like hardcore into it, you know, and, oh yeah, it's, it's so true. And, and, of course, it is like that, and um, focus my whole life on it, you know. So I th I see it more like a something open, very interesting. Um, what fascinates me most about it is that it has a certain factor of possibility and plausibility. So it's it's definitely better than just pure science fiction, you know, pure fantasy. So it. Could, this could actually be a real, you know. So okay. this is like the, the very fascinating part of it. Yeah, because I agree with that as well. Because I'm not really, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. But I do things, I do question things. You know, one of those is like Area Fifty One, for example. Yeah. They say that they, you know, some aliens crashed there as well. The Nazca Lines is a really interesting one as yeah. well. If you were to choose any company, like to be. Um, endorsed by like, any guitar company or any musical company to be endorsed by whether it be pedals guitars or any kind of equipment which one would it be uh for me personally i can't really speak for the others um none <laughs> i have my stuff i don't really need anything else honestly it's it's more like what would be interesting uh is to do like something new you know come up with a new amp or or effect or something like that that will be interesting I definitely would like to do that. Yeah. But that like from, from existing stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know. I have what I need. 
I'm just more afraid that because these uh, Zoom effect units are pretty old by now, that uh, they will all break down at some point, you know. Mm. I'm more afraid about that and then I'm kind of a bit lost. Would we'll have to come up with something mm. for my my sound, my specific sound. So uh, maybe I should work with, with Zoom Corporation for like uh re-emerging uh, the old uh, effect unit or something like that make it better because it has uh, some flaws that could have been done better in my opinion uh but like overall basic is is still awesome to this day I and, think. and how many of those units do you have um working units i have here i have four okay and um one at the band room no actually i have five here so i have six working units and uh three are um well they have some issues so uh i try to have them fixed but i don't know if it uh, is possible yet i see because that was gonna be my question like if you just had like I was hoping that you had more than one, just in case, because it's old gear, and in case it broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, uh, I started funny. buying them up <laughs> because, yeah, it's pretty simple with uh, through MIDI. Um, um, you can just you know copy all your settings to it, so uh, it's a simple thing to to do. Hmm. Like if there was a um, <laughs> if there was a Tobias or Winter or Roth. Uh, signature zoom preamp I'll, <laughs> I'll totally get one and i'll i'll use the crap out of that <laughs> yeah so zoom if you're listening to this uh interview right now like you got to make it <laughs> yeah hit him up right hit up tobias let's um let's make this uh let's make this pedal a real thing yeah one thing uh you asked me about like my influences musically and yes. uh, i was a bit like whoop yeah uh, sure, definitely like the the typical '90s uh, black metal, new wave of black metal stuff from Norway and Sweden, but it's it's quite quite much more actually. You know, it's also stuff like Klaus Schulze, uh, definitely other uh, psychedelic '70s stuff. Um, definitely a lot of dark ambient stuff from like the mid. 90s to like beginning 2000s that there was a lot of really interesting stuff like uh, innate like apoptose uh, i was talking about before um uh, also like really experimental stuff like carlo runo or subliminal um that that was all all a huge influence um also Stuff like uh, I don't know if you know it, uh, Devil Doll. Never heard of a really obscure project uh, back in like end of eighties, beginning of nineties from uh, Slovenia, um, from Ljubljana. It's uh, really interesting. You should really have a listen to this one, um, because it's just so unique. You have never heard anything like that before. That's for sure. Very theatrical um lots of of nice melodies nice songs yeah um what else yeah also a lot of psychedelic trance music for dark space definitely i mean the musical orientation when when we started with dark space like okay we, we will have like this space concept um musically what's our orientation and yeah, definitely black metal uh, or extreme metal in general, but more like, yeah, atmospheric black metal, uh, psychedelic stuff and um, Goa. Yeah, trance, psytrance. I actually wanted to, wanted to make a mix between psytrance and, and black metal. So the trance part is, is not that much uh, in it, like musically, but definitely from, from like... Um, you know, just the way songs are built, the ways uh, melodies, um, synthesizer stuff, uh, definitely yeah, a big influence as well. So um, it's quite broad, actually. I also love Arvo Pert, 
you know, modern classical com composer. Never heard of Marvo Pert? No, I haven't. Okay, check it out. <laughs> so, um, great stuff. And for for Dark Space, um, I oriented myself um, also on the first Brutality album, Screams of Anguish, which is death metal, but uh, it has just some... It's a, it's a real space album to me, just from the feeling, you know, the sound and the, how that this album feels is also like the melodies and and stuff. It's it's it has a, a really psychedelic character to it, in my perception. So um, I definitely took that one as a influence, like uh, consciously. And for uh, for my vocals, I oriented myself. I was also trying, you know, to find some kind of like a uniqueness to the vocals and uh, I oriented myself on the first coroner album and uh, also uh, yeah the mystery stomps out on us <laughs> so I wanted to have something in, in between there or in, in this direction to have like something alien sounding in what I imagine what an alien would sound like you know yeah that's a really that's a really interesting um, parallel that I didn't think about before, which was Demysterious, because I remember listening to that for the first time and I was like, these aren't black metal vocals. These are something completely different. It was kind of like a operatic dying demon or something. <laughs> some, just some crazy sound that Attila was creating, but I can kind mm -hmm. of I can see the parallels now. Yeah. Yeah. And, like uh, it's more like going up and down. So uh, I do that too, not, not differently than than Attila does. You know, I I don't want to copy anyone. Mm. It's just like you know, leaning towards like, okay, this direction is probably the correct direction to go. Let's try it. And um, Coroner also have that. You know, he he also has like this kind of up and down wo vocals. So mm. it's not just screams or just shouts. It's it has movement in it. God, that's so interesting because that's something I was literally thinking about. The bands I'm listening to like a lot more now, there's a lot more kind of like, not only this in the music, but there's actually more going on with the vocals now as mm -hmm. well. Because it's, I've just gotten into this thing now of like listening to like extreme metal bands that have like some kind of clean vocal. Yeah. Well, um, Neil Obliviscaris being one of them. And um, I recently started listening to Xanthocroid as well which is, they're, they're quite interesting because it's almost like a, it's almost like a Disney soundtrack becomes extreme metal, but without being like Disney and flowery. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, it's interesting because it's not like, it's okay. So it's, it's still very kind of romantic, but it's not like cartoony, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. The music and the writing is so well done. Like you can tell like they're, they've definitely done their research into, medieval harmony and, mm. and classical composition and really taking their time on, on the writing as well and you know everyone's very very talented in the band as well it gets one-dimensional sometimes if a band's just a bit too kind of like okay yeah this is the vocal it's kind of like traditional like this other band here's the riffs it kind of like it's very stylistic to the genre it's like i don't know maybe i don't know maybe i'm getting bored of listening to similar things and i want new things and i is probably that I don't know. Maybe I just want more um, more things going on in a composition, or maybe I just want movement, journey, yeah. over Yeah, journey. That's a good word. Yeah, okay. yeah. Let's um, mm. more songs as opposed. To, okay, I want to listen to songs, not a compilation of riffs. Mm. That's that's the kind of yeah. yeah. That's the kind of vibe. It's, uh, if possible, a whole album. That just yeah, I, I want to be taken by hand, you know, and and come with me, and I'll show you, you know, journey. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's it's... what I want. And if it's nothing new, that's fine too, you know. If it's if it's just great music, it's great music. If it sounds uh, it's, if it's like a dark throne cop, you know, whatever. I don't care if it's just like great music. If it takes me by my hand and. Uh, tr takes me to someplace else and shows me something, then it's fine. But of course, it's much better if it's something new, something I haven't heard before. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's well, that that's the perfect, you know, perf perfect uh, album then. But 
I don't know, it's it's not that much new music I listen to. It's also because I don't have much time. And if I listen to something, it's it's usually stuff uh, I already have. So, yeah, I think the uh, last band actually I have bought albums from is uh, Ereb Altor, Swedish uh, Viking, mm -hmm. very Bathory-like uh, stuff. But they have just such great songs and they have the right mix be between like sweetness and harshness. So they, they have like quite sweet songs, you know, with like clean vocals, but they're like really, really on a high level, really good vocals. And um, then they also have like more like black metal ish songs, like quite harsh stuff. And uh, yeah, that's that's a band I really admire. I remember I have listened to like their first album or so and I was like, nah, that's not really my cup of tea. But they really they have gotten better from almost from album to album. It's not not every album as good as the other, but um Natram is is really good. And mm -hmm. also the last one, uh what's it called? Varg Timan, I don't know. Yeah, Varg Timan. Okay, sweet. Yeah, that one is uh, some really nice songs to it too. What do you think the black metal scene needs going forward in the rest of um, the 2020s? What do you think needs to change in black metal? Ooh. And what do you want to see more of in the black metal scene? Um... Well, I'm still waiting for more albums like, you know, like the classics, <laughs> something like a, another Anthems, uh, what's, what's, what was, what's it called? The Anthem. An Anthems at Welkin at Dusk. Yeah. Something like that. Or like the first Limbonic Art album. Mm. Something that just really blows your mind. Uh, these are just examples, you know. But something exciting. I'm I'm missing that. But hey, maybe I just missed it because I didn't hear it yet. You know, I can't I can't listen to everything. What I think is very interesting with black metal is that you always have like new kind of streams to it um, that discover new things. So it's um, as always something new to it. You know, you always have bands like trying out new things um you know like blue Tows nord from france or um you also have like this swedish stream like head on fert i don't know if uh, you have listened to that one before which they, they they use um the guitar they make black metal but it's almost not distorted it's only just like like a little little bit of distortion to the guitar it's really interesting it really sounds like directly coming out of the forest or something because of that. So it's a very interesting approach. And um, yeah, so it's, you always have like something new and that should definitely go on, you know, like be, be stay creative with it, explore the possibilities of black metal or like metal in general. Or For me, actually, it's the, the sound of distorted guitars. Um, that was uh, what fascinated me uh, since since childhood, you know, since I was a little kid. When I first heard a distorted guitar, I was just, you know, I was like enchanted <laughs> um, forever. That was um, that was what it was all about for me. Not not this specifically metal music. It's just that kind of music that happens to use distorted guitars, you know. But maybe you could do a lot more with distorted guitars with that sound than metal, you know? So um, there's definitely more out there to explore, in my opinion. And uh, I hope people are going to do that.